Matthew chapter 27, verse 29. Matthew chapter 27, verse 29. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Mark chapter 15, verse 17. And they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head. John chapter 19, verse 2. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. John chapter 19 verse 5. And then came Jesus forth. Wearing the crown of thorns. And the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them. Behold the man. Behold the man. Simple thought. A crown of thorns for a crown that fadeth not away. Incorruptible. Are you willing to be mocked? Are you willing to suffer? Are you willing to wear, as it were, the crown of thorns before the crown of life? Jesus said, if you're going to reign with me, you're going to suffer with me. We enjoy roses, most do, the smell, the sweetness, the look. But don't you agree that roses could do a lot better without the thorns? Wouldn't it be better if the roses didn't have thorns? And some of those thorns are big. Big thorns. But the simple truth is, is that roses do have thorns. You've heard the term, he never promised you a rose garden. But yet, that is the life of a Christian, is it not? A rose garden. Thank God for the roses. Amen. Thank God for the good times. But with every rose. There is. A thorn. Interesting that the word rose. Is the same word that was used when Jesus come up, come up out of the grave. The third day morning. He arose. He rose. But before he rose, there was suffering. Amen. Before he was exalted, he suffered. That's human nature, to avoid suffering. Nobody runs into suffering. It's in their right mind. Now, we have a generation today that's running right into suffering and they enjoy pain, but they're not in their right minds. Many of them are demon-possessed, controlled by demons. But if you're in your right mind, you don't enjoy suffering. Nonetheless, you do have to go that way. 
If you suffer with me, you shall reign with me. He makes it very clear that if you're going to follow him, that you too must take up your own cross and follow him. Jesus is not the only one that had to bear a cross. We want to say today that, oh, Jesus bared the cross for me and it's all downhill from here. That's a false gospel. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his own cross. And as I shared with you in the last message, Jesus let us know. He gave us a heads up. He told the disciples. He didn't mince words. He didn't try to make light of what the cross was all about. When Jesus discussed with the disciples and talked about the cross, they knew what he was saying. See, today, we don't really know altogether about a cross. But if we was to say today, if any man will come after me, he must deny himself and go to the electric chair. He must deny himself and be executed. You see, the cross was capital punishment under the Roman rule. It was a cruel, cruel, cruel way to die. They would break the legs of the men if they didn't die. If they tried to hang on to life, they would break their legs to get them to die quicker. Amazing how human life, someone in, that really wants to live, they'll hang on, hang on, hang on. Especially if they're slipping into hell. But the Roman soldiers come by and break their legs. Get them to die quicker. You know, the Roman soldiers that crucified people, that crucified criminals, they had no mercy. Not only did they not have mercy, but they enjoyed it. Are you listening to Brother Joseph? They enjoyed watch. In fact, the more suffering, the more pain that they could inflict. You know, we're seeing this today. We're seeing police officers. We're watching those that are supposed to be protecting the public, enjoying watching people suffer under their own fist, under their own taser guns. Oh yeah, there's, there, there is an appetite today of enjoyment to watch people suffer. Under the Roman rule, they used to take Christians and throw them to the lions. And, it, and they would just, like, come together, and it was their time of entertainment. The Romans would bring their wives and their children, and they would sit in the bleachers, you know, sit, and they would watch people die. Watching people being eaten by lions. And cheer. Are you listening to Brother Joseph? Can you believe that people could be reduced to that kind of mentality? To watch their fellow human die such a cruel death and cheer it on Without question, the little children must have grown up 
with a attitude with a very hard heart watching people dying at the mouths of lions folks because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold let me tell you it's going to get colder it's going to get colder. You're going to endure some suffering. Now, my message is not altogether about the suffering as much as I want to talk to you about being long-suffering. You and I are not long-suffering, but the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering. God can give you the strength to endure hardship, to endure affliction. In your human frame, in your human strength, you can't. The flesh is weak, but the Spirit's willing. And you can endure tremendous suffering when God's nature, when God's spirit is helping you. We see in the scripture where under Nero, where Christians were burned at the stake and while they were burning, while they were in the very fire, they were singing the praises of of Zion. They were singing to God. They were they were praising and worshiping God while they were burning. What a testimony. What a living testimony. Amen. Going up in smoke and praising God. You talk about grace. You talk about the power of, of God in the joy of the Lord. Praising and worshiping God while you're burning to death. Amen. Praise God. It's real, folks. It's real. It's real. It's real. Now, do I have to be thrown into a lion's den? Do I need to be thrown into a pit? Do I need to be uh, thrown into a fiery furnace? Do I need to be thrown into a dungeon or to a prison like Paul and Silas? Do I need to experience that? Well, if God thinks I do, then I do. I'm not looking for it. I'm looking for Him. Looking unto Jesus. Amen? The author and the finisher of our faith. But if we have to endure some of that, praise the Lord. When we need the strength, when we need the grace, God will give it to us at the time. That's what Corey Din Tin Boone's father or her dad had told her. He said, Corey, when you need when you need the grace, your heavenly Father will give you what you need in the hour you need it. Oh yeah, he's faithful. God is faithful. Now, there's a lot of folks that are going to recant because of the fear of death or because their own children are suffering, whatever, for whatever reason, under that pressure. And if you can't serve God now in the easy place, what are you going to do in the hard place? When you are faced with the chopping block, when you're faced with the guillotine, I know what I'm talking about, folks. 
I believe the word of God. Everyone that does not receive that mark. You say, the mark's already in place. It's already, everything's already set up. They just figure the people are not ready for it yet or God is so merciful he hasn't allowed them to do it. But everything's set up. The same barcode scanner that they use to scan the food when, they, when you go buy your groceries is the same exact barcode that you're going to be, you're going to have that you're going to be, you're part of the merchandise, friend. Whether you're understanding it or not, The scanners are right there at the grocery store already. Can't buy or sell. What's the mark going to be? Well, more than likely it's going to be an implantable chip or, or a barcode of some sort. It doesn't really matter what the, what the mark is. What, the, the, what you need to be concerned with is, do you believe it? Are you doing something to avoid it? Are you, if you're going to be here during that time, are you going to have enough of God in your life that you will not bow, that you will not recant, that you will not reject Jesus in that hour, that great test? I believe there's only one religion, one ideology on the earth right now that cut heads off. As far as I know, there's only one, and that's Islam. And so I believe Islam is going to take over the whole earth. And I believe that from what I understand from the book of Zechariah, the word curse in the book of Zechariah is the word Allah. Look it up. So Islam's already taken over much of Europe. It's just a matter of time before it begins to really invade the United States. But I believe we are on the very cusp. I believe we're right on the very, we are right at the door of a nuclear weapon being detonated in the United States. I believe that. Probably a, nu probably a nuclear suitcase, a suitcase bomb, without question. Uh, Obama just recently said, I think it's more probable for a nuclear weapon to go off or to be detonated in lower Manhattan than it is to believe that Russia would attack the United States. Those are his own words, uh, which should be a trigger, which should be a, a, a flag to us to let us know what's coming. Um, several years ago when I was in Haiti, God gave me a dream and I saw a nuclear weapon going off in the United States. And after the dream, I said, God, what is this? And I received a scripture from Psalm 91. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked, but it shall not come nigh thee. So I believe with all my heart that something has to happen in the United States for things to get worse. I don't know why I'm even saying these things other than the fact that God wants me to say these things, that God wants to say these things through us. But I don't really want to talk about this. I think every minister truly wants to, wants to share the excitement, you know, the, the, the exciting things of God's word, the, the joy and just really the thrilling things. Who really wants to talk about nuclear weapons and people being thrown to the lions. Who wants to talk about those things? But I learned something today. I was telling you about how I went and smell, went, went to a store to buy some essential oils and, and uh, bought or went and smelled the myrrh and how it was something I didn't want, didn't, did not want to buy. Didn't like the smell of it. Well, I got to thinking about the Song of Solomon. It says that myrrh 
was dripping from the lock on the door. The lock was on the inside of the door. But for her to touch the lock, to unlock the door, she had to first touch the myrrh. You will never be able to... Now, God showed me that the lock on the inside of the door is a type of our will. You will never be able to lose your will except through suffering. Myrrh speaks of suffering. Now, Jesus, in, that, in the scripture, in Song of Solomon, the bridegroom, her beloved, the scripture says that he was knocking at the door. He reached his hand in through the lattice. That tells me that as he reached his hand through the lattice, he was able to touch the lock because he got myrrh on it. How many know Jesus is the suffering Savior? Amen? His whole ministry, his whole life on this earth speaks of suffering. He learned obedience by the things he suffered. But for him to, for there to be myrrh on the lock, dripping from the lock in Song of Solomon, he had to have touched that lock. Now God will touch your will. Listen to what Brother Joseph's telling you. God will try and help you. He'll touch your will. He'll give you grace to help you to do right. But listen to what I'm telling you. He will never force you against your will. But we see how far he went for his bride. That he was willing to reach his hand in, which is a type of his power. He touched the lock from the outside of the door. He touched the lock on the inside of the door. Why was the door locked in the first place? She knew he was coming to get her. She was supposed to get married to him that night. It was her wedding time to come and become one with him. She said, she make light of it. How can I get up? You know, I've washed my feet and I've, I'm in bed. She's putting him off. But he's doing everything he can to get through that door without breaking it down, without being forceful, without violating. Now, even though she is his bride, legally, in the Jewish customs, he's al she's already become his bride, but they have not become one yet. And she has locked the door. Does that sound right to you? She's either afraid of something on the outside. You know, when did you ever think that, that a Christian would have to lock their doors? I mean, there was a time in America where you didn't have to lock your doors. People left their windows open and let the, let the air come into their house at night while they were sleeping. No, nobody, nobody worried. But every, everything's locked up today. Alarms. Are you listening to what I'm telling you? But even the Christians being affected by that. Living in fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Why are we walking around living in fear? Well, what, why are we full of fear, folks? There is no fear in love. Perfect love casteth out fear. So why do we live in fear? Why is the door locked? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Why is he knocking on the door? It's his church. 
The lock is locked on the inside of the door of the church and Jesus can't get in. And that lock is our will and he will not violate our wills, folks. We must come to that place of suffering. Amen. Not my will, but thy will be done. We must have that experience. We must come to that place, Gethsemane. We must come to that place, folks, where we lose our will for his will. Amen. The lock, our will, amen, is being touched by myrrh. It's being touched by the hand of God and there's suffering involved. But God's not going to force us. He's not going to force us against our wills. Suffering will come our way, but he will not force us. And the scripture says, when she finally got up to unlock the door, he was gone. What a shock. When she realized she wasn't dreaming, she realized it wasn't just someone else outside that door. When she woke up, when she finally came to her senses and understood, oh my, what happened? I missed it. He came. He's gone. I missed him. He came to get her. He came to get her, folks. He was going to take her away. Amen. And become one with her. That was his, that's his bride. But she made light of it. She slept. Are you listening? The church is fully asleep and the bride of Christ is half asleep, half awake. What's it going to take to wake us up, folks? If the bride of Christ, the elite of Christ, are asleep, at least half asleep, I'll tell you what it's going to take. It's going to take suffering. Suffering. I believe the, the spirit of Antichrist is going to rise in the land like never before. People that are enjoying their jobs right now, Christians that have good jobs, they're about to be persecuted. It's not flesh and blood we're fighting with. It's principalities. It's wicked spirits. It's an Antichrist spirit that's rising in the land. It's against Christ and it's against his followers. It's against his people. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to be mocked. We're going to be made fun of. And I believe we're coming into a time where the sinner that our managers and bosses over companies are going to begin to persecute the Christians in the workplace. If it's not already started, it's going, to, it's going to get bad. Now, judgment begins in the house of God. All of these things are happening for God to wake us up. That's what, it's, that's what it's about. God is awakening. He's trying to stir us and wake us up. Are you understanding what's happening here, folks? Jesus did not come to his disciples and say, come on, continue to sleep. He said, you're going to sleep now? I'm, I'm about to be delivered into the hands of sinners and you're going to sleep now? Is this any time to be sleeping, folks? Is this any time to be sleeping on your post? We need to be awake. We need to be aroused, awakened. High time to awake out of our sleep, out of our slumber. Amen? Can you hear it? Some say they hear the sound of abundance of rain. I hear the sound of soldiers' footprints. I can hear the sound of the, of the soldiers coming. Are you listening? I hear the sound of footmen, soldiers, the United Nations coming to take over the United States of America. That's what I hear. And in all this, 
they drew not near to God. They made not their prayer to the Lord. Are you listening, folks? What's it going to take to wake us up? What's it going to take to awaken the sleeping giant? Well, it's going to take suffering. It's going to take a crown of thorns before you receive the crown of life. Whether you suffer now or suffer later, if you're going to receive a crown of life, you're going to suffer somewhere along the way. You can't avoid it. You can't avoid it. 